Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bonnie Glazer. I'm director of the China Power Project here at CSIS. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, we're privileged uh, to have the Assistant Secretary of State, Dave Stilwell, uh, to give us a speech today. Uh, Assistant Secretary Stilwell assumed the post uh, of the Assistant Secretary of State for the, uh, of course, Bureau of East Asian Pacific Affairs on June 20th of this year. I'm guessing it seems like a lot longer than that, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's just about uh, over six months. Uh, his position immediately prior to that was as a director of the China Strategic Focus Group at uh, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command in uh, Hawaii. Mr. Stilwell served in the Air Force for 35 years. We were just chatting about uh, uh, linguistic backgrounds. Um, so he began as an enlisted Korean linguist, learning uh, Korean when he was 18, um, and uh, retired in 2015 with the rank of Brigadier General. His last position as a military officer was Asia advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, Assistant Secretary Stilwell served multiple tours of duty, as many of you know, in Japan and Korea as a linguist. He was a fighter pilot and a uh, commander. And uh, he served as a defense attache at the US Embassy in Beijing from 2011 to 2013. So you know, given uh, the growing complexity of the U.S.-China relationship, um, we definitely need to have a steady hand uh, at the tiller at the uh, Department of State, and we know we have that with Assistant Secretary Stilwell. Um, please join me in welcoming him. Good afternoon, and uh, thanks for waiting a week. Um, you know, things happen at the worst possible time. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, I've been, uh, I think it's my third interaction with CSIS since I've gotten this job in six months. That's a, a good pace, I think, uh, to go. The title of today's uh, presentation is uh, U.S.-China Bilateral Relationships and the Lessons of History. Or if I was to translate it into Chinese, it would be shi shi chiu shi, right? Seek truth through facts. The goal is to plow through a lot of uh, misinformation and assumptions on both sides. Uh, and just sort of identify uh, what has been a very productive uh, interaction, you know, at least in one respect, with the Chinese uh, country, with the people, uh, and with the government, uh, and to clear the air, and to help, uh, you know, lay out the facts. Um, in particular, uh, I want to focus on a part of this history that's hugely important and yet often overlooked, uh, namely the vast range of official U.S. contributions sustained over decades uh, they've empowered the People's Republic of China in aiding in this development. So why recount history? Well, I'm a historian. That's what I studied in school. Uh, my master's degree was in um, Chinese military modernization. Uh, that's going to come up later in the speech. Uh, and it, it's always good to take a pause and reflect. So if we don't acknowledge this history, we can't claim to understand the current state of U.S.-China relations. Uh, second, history is colorful and dramatic and involves secret presidential directives, sensitive diplomacy, uh, some of the most consequential economic and technological shifts the world has ever seen, and it's a very long history, which means it's going to be a very long speech, and I apologize in advance, uh, but I think you'll enjoy the, uh, again, hearing the, uh, the story. Um, but the most important aspect of this is that recounting this history refutes false claims of propagandists who claim that the Trump administration's competitive posture toward Beijing is motivated by some long-standing American animus or, or some desire to, in their words, quote, keep China down. The fact is that for decades, American policymakers have extended the hand of friendship to the, to the PRC, and yet that has not been reciprocated. Uh, this historical record will show that clearly. When commentators occasionally discuss how American policy has contributed to Chinese empowerment, they often focus on America's general role in sustaining a free and open Indo-Pacific, sea lanes, and all the rest. Their point is that, you know, like a more passive form, this international order provided by uh, the U.S. is what allowed China and others in the region to focus on economic growth and trade and the rest. Um, that certainly is a large part of the story, but uh, and uh, to create and preserve that international order uh, required enormous U.S. Uh, expenditures of blood, treasure, and ideas. But uh, there's more to that story. 
Uh, China was not just the indirect beneficiary of all this. Um, it, uh, U.S. support for China's development was deliberate, direct, and specific. It took many forms. Um, in short, we'll get to the details here. We provided military and intelligence assistance. We made generous technology transfers. We ensured preferential trade and investment access. We sponsored and, and arranged for vast educational exchanges, and we still do. And we provided development financing and organized government-to-government -government capacity building, uh, and much more. So before we get into details, I want to note that the primary drivers of China's strengthening were the Chinese people themselves. The China's greatest achievements in recent decades reflect the intelligence, uh, the talents, and the courageous and entrepreneurial spirit of the Chinese. Those traits fueled China's growth when the Chinese Communist Party finally loosened uh, the disastrous stranglehold that it had placed on the people in the Chinese, in the PRC's uh, opening decades. Once Communist Party leaders recognized the failures of the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, and the chaotic fight for succession following Mao's uh, death, and they moved to liberalize China's system, uh, the Chinese people were able to get to work, and the United States and others were enthusiastic about offering our help. But acknowledging the centrality of the Chinese people in this story shouldn't bind us uh, to the important contributions, or shouldn't blind us to the important contributions of others, especially to the contributions of the United States. Unfortunately, the PS PRC has acted in recent years uh, with increasingly, increasing hostility uh, toward the United States, our interests, uh, and our principles. This has prompted the American people uh, and the current administration to reevaluate re re these policies. As Secretary, Secretary Pompeo has said, uh, we accommodated and encouraged China's rise for decades, uh, even when that rise was at the expense of American values, Western democracy, security, and good common sense, unquote. So Beijing's hostile behavior was not inevitable. It was not justified, and it's not a cho it, it is, in fact, a choice by Chinese leaders. It is by no means what American officials desired or expected 40 years ago when they initiated this multifaceted U.S. policy of intense support for Beijing's modernization and its liberalization. America's willingness to help China achieve its ambitions was clear to leader Deng Xiaoping, even before he inaugurated the era of reform and opening uh, at a Communist Work Party conference in December 1978. Indeed, on the very day that he presented and opened this concept of reform and opening, uh, he also accepted an invitation from the U.S. government uh, that had been tendered prior uh, to become the first PRC leader to visit the United States. By the next month, U.S. and China had announced normalization of their relations, and Deng was on an airplane to Washington. I mentioned this story in another speech earlier this month, but I'm going to repeat it just because it needs to be restated. Uh, on that flight to the U.S., as historian John Pomfret records, Deng's foreign minister asked Deng Xiaoping why he picked the United States for his first trip as leader. Because, answered Deng, America's allies are all rich and strong, and if China wants to be rich and strong, it needs America. Sound logic? For Deng, the engineer of the China's modernization and prosperity, it was clear that America could be relied on to help. Uh, he was pushing longstanding PRC plans for the four modernizations, we know what those are, addressing science and technology, industry, agriculture, and defense. Uh, and the U.S. would help in all four areas, and, and then some. And this produced results. So after the horrific privations caused by the Cultural Revolution, Deng Xiaoping intensely desired that Chinese students would study in the United States. I believe we have uh, some here. When Deng received a visit from White House science advisor Frank Press in the run-up to normalization, uh, Deng insisted that Press call the president immediately uh, with a request to take 5,000 Chinese students. Awakened by that call at 3 in the morning, President Carter replied, tell him to send 100,000. And so uh, he re relayed that, re that uh, suggestion. By 1987, less than 10 years later, there were indeed 100,000 Chinese students studying in America, part of a boom in visas, scholarships, and other educational exchange that transformed science and technology in the PRC. Uh, and that process is still booming. Technology was a key theme of Deng's 1979 uh, first trip to the U.S., and he visited Ford Motor Company, Boeing, and NASA. He signed an agreement for U.S. aid to science in China. And he agreed with the White House to establish a joint intelligence station in northwest China uh, known as Operation Chestnut. It led to deeper military uh, and intelligence cooperation. Several months after Deng's trip, Vice President Mondale visited China, and he told Deng Xiaoping, we have insisted repeatedly, and I will state it again, we strongly believe in the importance of a strong China. 
Mondale showed it by previewing a major accommodation on trade policy and human rights. The, the United States would grant China most favored nation trading status, uh, cutting tariffs on Chinese goods to the preferential level offered to friends and allies, even though Beijing did not meet the political and civil rights standards required for that status under U.S. law. Kind of hoping. Creating this kind of exception for the PRC would become common U.S. practice. The Carter administration also used America's leading position at the World Bank to clear the path for China's membership in 1980. Beijing began receiving World Bank loans the following year, and it has since received some $62 billion, making it the world's second largest beneficiary of World Bank support. After President Carter left office, many U.S. foreign policies changed, but the approach to aiding China's modernization endured. It even intensified. The Reagan administration helped PRC especially in the military and technology domains. In 1981, President Reagan issued National Security uh, Decision Directive, NSDD-11, opening the path to sell the Chinese air, ground, naval, and missile technology. This built on Carter's 1980 authorization of the sale of PRC of non-lethal military equipment. In 1983, Reagan's uh, NSDD-76 authorized peaceful nuclear cooperation to boost Beijing's civilian nuclear program. And by the mid-1980s, the U.S. had agreed to sell the PRC hundreds of millions of dollars worth of torpedoes, anti-artillery uh, radar, and other military systems and equipment. In 1986, U.S. and China announced the Peace Pearl Program to modernize Chinese uh, F-8 fighters with sophisticated navigation radar and other electronics. Peace Pearl, the Pentagon said, would improve the security of a friendly country, which has been an important force for political stability and economic progress in Asia and the world. Those are very optimistic and positive words. And if you have any questions on Peace Pearl, you can talk to Ken Allen back there, who has photos, stories. Uh, he's got the entire um, program that he can relate to you. And I encourage you to talk to him because it is uh, eye-watering. The Reagan administration uh, loosened controls on export of technology to the PRC in 1983, and again, furthering work that began in the Carter years. Before a 1984 visit by PRC Premier uh, Zhao Ziyang, Reagan signed NSDD 120, directing the administration to lend support to China's ambitious modernization effort, especially through our liberalized technology transfer policy. The classified policy document stated that the U.S. seeks a strong, secure, and stable China that can be an increasing force for peace, both in Asia and the world. In 1986, the Reagan administration even helped the PRC establish research programs in genetic engineering, automation, biotech, lasers, space technology, manned space flight, intelligent robotics, and supercomputers. That year, the U.S. also worked with Japan and others to usher Beijing into the Asia Development Bank, which later extended the PRC $40 billion in loans for transport, energy, water, agriculture, finance, and other projects. So let's recall that in the first decade after normalization in 1979, as in the years immediately before 1979, a key U.S. consideration in America's China policy was, of course, the Cold War, uh, in which the PRC was a counterweight to the Soviet Union. But even when the Cold War ended, U.S. policy toward China remained highly favorable. So as the Cold War was drawing to a close, U.S. leaders went out of their way to show their intention to remain committed to China. Recall that George H.W. Bush uh, response to the Tiananmen Massacre of 1989. Here was a brutally violent refutation of the optimistic notion that modernization by the Chinese Communist Party would mean political liberalization, something I assumed um, all along. But nevertheless, President Bush decided not to fundamentally reassess U.S. relations with the PRC after 1989. The senior Bush suspended new arms sales, but he decided to follow through on many existing programs to include Peace Pearl, which was terminated later by the Chinese uh, and not the U.S. President Bush uh, also opposed economic sanctions favored by a majority of members of Congress. Now is the time, he told the public, to look beyond the moment uh, to important and enduring aspects of this vital relationship for the United States. Though the administration announced it had suspended high-level contacts with the PRC, Bush dispatched the National Security Advisor on a secret mission to Beijing, carrying letters that stressed the importance of getting our relationship back on track. And so the two sides did. The measured U.S. response to the massacre reflected a hopeful and accommodationist frame of mind that continued to shape U.S. policy toward China for years to come. Across decades, we accommodated the PRC's human rights abuses without significant protest. We mostly shrugged at the, US, at the PRC's proliferation of nuclear and missile technology to Pakistan, Iran, and North Korea, and others. 
We largely overlooked the PRC's diversion of U.S. origin dual-use technology uh, to the military. We offered little opposition uh, to the PRC's theft of intellectual property, piracy of trademark goods, and countless other unfair trade practices. Policymaking requires balancing interests, and we often had reasons to let this or that PRC offense go unanswered. But the consequences mounted. Following Tiananmen, one change that did come was the PRC leaders introduced a harsh patriotic education campaign in China into the schools and culture. The aim of this campaign was to shore up support for the Communist Party uh, by playing to nationalism and vilifying foreigners, especially Americans and Japanese, as so-called hostile forces seeking to contain China and block its rise. Stoking this mythology of U.S. hostility was itself a hostile act against the U.S., but U.S. officials hardly took notice. Excuse me. Instead, we concentrated on producing the next chapter in our policy of support for the PRC. And this was probably the most favorable and consequential of all, uh, PRC accession to the World Trade Organization. President Bill Clinton entered office highly critical of Beijing's human rights record. He promised to reestablish uh, the link between the PRC's trade privileges and human rights, uh, as the Jackson-Vanik Amendment concerning most favored nation status had intended. However, by 1984, uh, Clinton had dropped that insistence. He began to favor bestowing on the Chinese, on the PRC, permanent normal trade relations and backing its membership in the WTO, even if there weren't improvements in human rights. He embraced an idea, long part of U.S. thinking about trade with the PRC, that became dogma. If we expand international trade links with China, it would in inevitably liberalize politically, benefiting the Chinese people, the cause of human rights, and the world in general. And that's a lofty ideal, and you know, it's very uh, laudable that we pursued that. Unfortunately, this view dominated U.S. thinking as U.S. played an indispensable role in bringing about China's WTO ac accession. And WTO accession was rocket fuel for PRC's ambitions, giving it the global market access that turned China into the world's manufacturing and export powerhouse. No policy has strengthened the PRC more. And like so much else, helping China enter the WTO uh, involved our purposefully ignoring PRC improper trade practices and empty promises. As Secretary Pompeo has said, we encourage Chinese membership in the World Trade Organization and other international organizations premised on their commitment to adopt market reforms and abide by the rules of those organizations. And all too often, China did not follow through. So the friendly U.S. approach to China in the 1990s was evident when the Federal, Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan visited uh, Beijing in 19, 1994. It is very important to the United States, as well as the whole world, that China succeed. Greenspan told uh, PRC Premier Zhu Rongji. Therefore, we're willing to provide as much assistance as we can to your central bank in those technical areas in which we have many years of experience. Generous technical assistance was a U.S. policy priority for decades. Even before normalization, President Carter issued Presidential Directive 43, instructing federal agencies to support PRC capacity building in education, energy, agriculture, space, geosciences, commerce, and public health. Soon, there was hardly an agency in Washington, D.C. without a program to provide training and know-how to strengthen PRC government capacity, to expand trade, and generally to aid PRC integration into global affairs. These programs lasted for decades, and they continue to the current day. No other country has received such an outpouring of U.S. capacity building as the PRC has. U.S. government similarly helped American business help Beijing. In the 1990s, American investment banks worked with PRC leaders to create state-owned mega firms such as China Mobile and then raise money via stock listings in places like New York and London. U.S. policy, meanwhile, allowed them to raise money from U.S. investors despite not meeting basic regulatory requirements. Tens of billions of dollars flowed into PRC state coffers. The 1990s also saw U.S. aid to uh, Chinese civil society uh, at the request, I should stress, of PRC government. The Asia Foundation and Ford Foundation partnered with PRC uh, officials on economic reform, international relations, and Beijing's own overseas assistance programs. The Carter Center signed an MOU with Beijing's Ministry of Civil Affairs in 1998 to help with experimental village elections. I think we all remember those. The American Bar Association spent two decades working with PRC judges, officials, and lawyers on criminal justice reform, legal training, and combating domestic violence. Heifer International helped thousands of Chinese farmers raise livestock more sustainably. And such efforts often receive funding from the U.S. government 
transparently in alignment with Beijing's own policies. Unfortunately, the PRC has grown inhospitable to foreign civil society groups. Beijing today paints foreign NGOs as insidious subversives, not partners in Chinese development. It's not that the NGOs have changed, Beijing has. It has lost its former enthusiasm for openness, transparency, and foreign links. Nor is the CCP keen to share any credit with outsiders for China's development, lest the starring role of the party be diminished. So Beijing today claims that US civil society groups are a black hand undermining China. Beijing also enforces a 2016 law designed to drive foreign NGOs out of China, uh, and it has successfully done that, reducing the number of NGOs from 7,000 in 2016 to mere hundreds today. These were not the outcomes sought by U.S. leaders before the 1990s or since. Presidents George, H, or George W. Bush and Barack Obama both had concerns about aspects of Beijing, Beijing's behavior, just as their predecessors had, and both took measures to hedge against risks posed by Beijing, but both ensured that the United States engaged the PRC fundamentally as a partner and a supporter. Both uh, expanded trade and technology ties with the PRC. Even as Beijing cheated on the U.S. Uh, and the trade, U.S. trade deficit with China soared to a cumulative $4 trillion. Both supported elevating Beijing's status in important international org organizations, even as Beijing often subverted the mission and spirit of these organizations. Both believe that Beijing uh, line, they, they bought into the line that irritants in the bilateral relationship could be worked out via ever more diplomatic pageantry and high-level dialogues. And both welcomed more uh, and more PRC students with some 270,000 in America by 2015. And just for the record, to clear the air and to uh, counter the misinformation, uh, the number of PRC university students in the U.S. is now at a whopping 370,000, contrary to allegations of us closing down that pipeline. So we're proud of America's long record of pursuing friendship with China and the Chinese people. In this 40th year since U.S. PRC normalization, it's worth recalling that U.S. optimism and friendship toward China and the Chinese people dates back centuries. American missionaries established hospitals and universities in China in the 1800s. American diplomats backed the open door policy in the late 1800s. And then they set up the Boxer Indemnity Scholarship in 1909 that seeded Tsinghua University. American soldiers defended China during World War II, sacrificing thousands of lives to support our alliance commitments and resist an expansive and aggressive uh, force. After the war, America insisted that China receive a seat among the founding members of the United Nations and a veto uh, on the Security Council. So in conclusion, it's natural that once uh, the PRC turned to reform an opening 40 years ago, America would extend our hand in friendship. It is also, and it is altogether bogus that Beijing today claims uh, that America's new competitive posture toward the PRC betrays some uh, long desire to keep, uh, quote, China down as a nation. On the contrary, our posture today is based on disappointment that Chinese Communist Party leaders decided to respond to our good faith with such an aggressive and consistent uh, bad faith. I just want to relate a personal story on this. Um, I, 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 while in Beijing, I became associated with a group that uh, actually fostered U.S.-China uh, relations uh, through the memory of uh, World War II. Uh, the book and the exhibit that they put out is called Guo uh, Jia uh, Ji, National Memories. It was here uh, at the Reagan uh, building, sponsored by Wilson Center, and then I sponsored it into the Pentagon in March of 2015. Um, these photos uh, began with a black and white photo handed to my, a friend of mine. Uh, uh, in 1999, of a funeral uh, happening, obviously in, the, in China, in southern China, with an American chaplain w and an American officer, a Major McMurray, being buried, and a bunch of Chinese soldiers, or Chinese people in, in, in um, soldiers' gear. Uh, he saw this photo, and based on the uh, educational process he went through, was, it, it tilted his world. He couldn't believe this actually happened. So he went into the Chinese archives to find the evidence that supported this, and he didn't find anything. But someone said, you can go to the US National Archives right here in, in DC and find more. He came here, he found 60,000 black and white photos of this very uh, mutually beneficial cooperation during World War II. And being disappointed in the history that he was taught uh, intentionally uh, has been spreading that word inside and outside of China ever since in the form of coffee table books, just full of these photos with stories and uh, these displays that I, I discussed. 
We have to recognize this history. It's key. It's what we in the open press world and those who can read whatever we care to understand is our history. It's the foundation for the relationship today. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer your questions further on this very important subject. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your um, tour de force Long. of yeah. history. No, it's, uh, it's important history, um, and I'm very glad that, uh, that you told it the way that you did, because there is so much uh, discussion officially in China today that is distorting that history and providing misinformation. And you didn't, of course, mention um, uh, more recent history in Hong Kong today, where uh, Beijing is accusing uh, the United States of uh, instigating uh, the protests uh, that, is, that is going on in, uh, in Hong Kong. And that's also, I'm sure you would agree, history that, that needs to be, uh, to be corrected. Absolutely. So um, if I could maybe uh, ask you just uh, a few questions and then we'll open it up. There's been some discussion about whether or not uh, there's a new Cold War between the United States and China. We actually had an event here uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, to talk about that issue. And I'm wondering if you think that there are any elements of the Cold War between the US and the, uh, and the former Soviet Union that apply to the US-China relationship, and whether there's any lessons that we can draw from the Cold War in managing the bilateral relationship with China. You bet. I would really like to see the outcomes of that conference, that, that conversation, because I, I was just at lunch with the ASEAN um, ambassadors, and that was my parting question to them, uh -huh. given that the, you know, Vietnam and Southeast Asia was such a major player um, in uh, the Cold War of the day. Um, I, I mean, I've given a lot of thought to this. People with my hairline grew up in the Cold War. I mean, Ken Allen's like the ultimate Ken Cold Warrior. Um, <laughs> I mean, Francis Fukuyama plays into this, and I think that goes into the ideological aspect of it, whether you're working free and open or closed and authoritarian. Uh, those parallels exist. Um, a lot of, when you say Cold War, you think nuclear and missiles pointed at each other and this uneasy detente. Uh, I would say that is mirrored today in some forms in the uh, information world, some would say in the space world and other places that are not kinetic, but they are still very much uh, could be existential. Um, but there are other aspects of it, given, and you know, thank you for teeing the speech up, is to say that there's opportunities to cooperate. And you, the U.S. is always willing to reach out a hand of friendship and meet the other side uh, where they are and show them a way, a, a better way. And unlike the Cold War, I think there's many more opportunities to have this conversation. And so I thank you for having this opportunity. And, if I had time, I would stick around and continue that, because I could learn a lot more from you guys uh, than you're <laughs> learning from me. Well, it's, uh, we're definitely learning a lot from, from you and all of your colleagues. Uh, dialogue has been a critically important component of the U.S.-China relationship since the beginning. Yeah. Um, we've had, we started with dialogue um, really only at the highest level. And then through the years, we developed mechanisms of dialogue to try to manage problems and address them. Uh, and of course, we had them in the economic relationship. I think there were 27, if I'm not mistaken, rounds of the JCCT, the Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade. We had the strategic um, and economic dialogue and of course, its predecessor. And today, um, we, of course, still have dialogue with China, but it doesn't look like what it used to look like over really the last couple of decades. And particularly in the State Department, where there were dialogues on regional functional issues, all of this, of course, fed into the SNED. So what is then the nature of dialogue today? Are there any kind of mechanisms that you think are particularly important and needed to address problems, is this um, uh, the, the, the set of mechanisms that we had in the past, are, are they all now irrelevant and no longer useful? A lot of answers there. Um, one, 
organizations like CSIS and others that conduct you know, track two and track 1.5 dialogues are in every way as valid as track one. Mm. Um, in fact, in some ways, they're more valid because they're not susceptible to the same bias and, and uh, unbalanced objectives that you get in the formal dialogues, especially when times are tense. And so I would hope that we don't, just because that proliferation of dialogues out there with um, so many acronyms that, you know, we had like a decoder ring uh, in the embassy as to which, which dialogue this was, SNED, SSD on the sidelines. Um, they have to produce something. And the, the, the track two and 1.5 do. You actually have people come in and, and share honest thoughts. Unfortunately, uh, dialogue for dialogue's sake uh, doesn't accomplish much. It, the very fact of meeting uh, demonstrates a willingness to cooperate. I think that's important being seen in that regard. But um, showing up without any intention of uh, trying to work through problems or, or, or find solutions uh, doesn't benefit anybody raises hopes, um, and as you know, over time, those hopes have not really been uh, met uh, on our side, at least the ones I witnessed in Beijing and when I was in the Pentagon. So this is a time to reset, rethink, and then approach these with a fresh set of eyeballs uh, and, and guarantee that something comes from them. Um, I'll ask one last question before we open it up. I, I, I think one of the other issues that's debated is whether or not the United States can still influence Chinese policy. I would assume as a, a person working at the State Department, now a diplomat, mm -hmm. uh, that you believe that there are still ways to really um, to shape China's choices, right. as Evan Medeiros used to say in the Obama administration when he was working at the National Security Council. So is this something that you believe going forward um, is possible? Are there, are there still ways that we can um, influence Chinese policies so that they become um, more uh, ad, ad, uh, committed and, and adhering to the, to the rules-based order, uh, to supporting uh, the, um, uh, the uh, system that uh, China has benefited from so much, uh, and uh, so that uh, China can work to actually solve some of the problems in the world. Again, as the history shows, the U.S. has been very eager to help uh, in this regard. However, the political distance has grown uh, between what they see as their uh, objectives and what the U.S. And here's the critical point. It's not just the U.S. It's the U.S. and most yes. of the rest of the world. This is where like-minded engagement comes in. This is where encouraging uh, EU and others to stand up for your own e trade uh, interests is helpful. And this is where I met this morning with uh, uh, an ambassador from Europe. I met uh, last week with another ambassador from Europe. Uh, I meet again with Southeast Asia. Uh, the, the way we get this to, to function is to enlist the assistance of those like-minded who also see the problem and encourage them not to sit back and wait till we resolve it, but to join us in it. Because that's this is a multifaceted uh, problem that, again, given the assistance of others uh, and multiple voices, makes it impossible to call this hostile U.S. policy. No, this is how the world works. So thank you for that question. Terrific. That was a message that I just heard. I was in, in Delhi the last few days and heard many uh, uh, experts and former officials and current officials in India saying that we all have to work together yeah. um, in order to pursue our outcomes that uh, all of the like-minded countries hope to achieve. Unless the Indo message be confused region. or twisted, mm. that outcome is basically status quo, a system that's worked very well for the world for the last 70 years uh, that we would like to see preserved uh, and their other side would like to change it to adapt to its particular worldview. So lest anybody confuse this is somehow trying to mm -hmm. change things. No, we just want to preserve the system as it exists. Okay, um, I'm going to open it up to questions and I'm gonna ask you to please wait for the microphone, identify yourself and ask one question and please make it short so that we can get in uh, a number of them. Okay, we're going to start over there. This gentleman right there, yes. Uh, yes. No, that's it. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. 
ask your question. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, this is really not a question. It's just offering a quick. Identify yourself, please. I'm sorry, Marvin Marvin Ott, formerly Marvin. federal government, long time now with the Wilson Center and Johns Hopkins University. Uh, a quick anecdote to add to your history, do you think it'd be relevant? Uh, as a grad student, I, I should have the exact year, it was the last year of Dean Rusk's tenure as Secretary of State, Johnson administration. I was invited to join a small discussion group that Rusk had as a visitor to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And in that talk, he recounted as recent news that the Soviet Union had formally appro approached the United States with regard to a reaction from America if the Soviet Union attacked the Chinese nuclear installations. And the answer that Rusk reported was we would be absolutely and virulently opposed to any such attack. Um, and I, I say I'll offer it simply as an anecdote, as as one that's relevant to the historical uh, narrative that you presented. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, this woman in yellow over here, yes. Uh, thank you for doing this. Rita Chen with Radio Free Asia. Uh, Assistant Secretary, you just mentioned that U.S. soldier defense the China during the World War II. And that China, uh, which is now also known as Taiwan, is going to have uh, another presidential election and in the coming January. I'm just wondering, that what's your expectation or prioritized task of the U.S.-Taiwan relation and close relations? Thank you. So that's a very good question and it, it very timely, right? We're about a month out from the elections. Yes, we are. Uh, you understand U.S. policy has been one of dialogue, encouraging dialogue on both sides. Elections are a regular process in the Taiwan democratic process. And so these happen every four years. Um, unfortunately, tension tends to spike uh, during this. They should not. Um, and the concern always exists for somehow meddling, interfering in the internal affairs uh, there. So we'll take you back to the uh, Taiwan uh, Relations Act and the three communiques, with the intent of which is to ensure that um, the, just the differences on the two sides of Taiwan Strait are resolved through dialogue and that without violence or coercion or threats. And so that's uh, our expectation for this upcoming event as well. Thank you. Great. Okay, woman over here on the end. Hello, Mr. Sowell. I'm Heya Lee with South Korea's Yonhap News Agency. I just wanted, I, I just noticed on your public schedule today that you had a meeting with the Swedish ambassador, and uh, I wanted to ask if the U.S. is uh, trying to arrange another working level meeting with North Korea in Sweden, mm -hmm. and if you could just comment in general about uh, the, the, the State Department's efforts ahead of this end of year uh, deadline imposed by North Korea. Thank you. Your, your dot connecting has, oh. has some, created something other than the initial picture we were trying to draw. But I, I, that's, a, that's pretty good, but no, that was not the subject. That uh, was actually uh, re requested by the uh, Swedish side. But based on my uh, open invitation to discuss the topic of trade, uh, and in this case, um, intrusion into Swedish internal affairs with the Guomin uh, mm -hmm. uh, Guomin High um, Guomin issue. High, yeah. Um, and so, no, that the topic was had nothing to do with North Korea because that is not my remit. So, <laughs> that very clear. Okay, this woman over there in the black and white dress. Hi, thank you, Miriam Sapiro, recovering government official. Um, thank you for that terrific presentation and important historical reminders. Um, I wanted to ask you. Uh, trade-related question, especially with the Sunday deadline looming, um, but it involves Huawei, which has been a bipartisan concern for several years, predating the Trump administration. But more recently, um, the administration, at least the president, seemed to tie Huawei issues into the trade talks, then to separate them. The Chinese side at some point also considered them tied and then separate. So I was wondering, um, as to your sense, as to whether or not these issues should be related or not be related as we approach not just this deadline, but presumably additional talks on additional phases. 
Thank you. The, the discussion on um, the exact objections to Huawei, I mean, clearly there's the classified aspect of that, which not at liberty here, but I think uh, many have covered the basic concern using China's own laws. It's a, the law that, that came out recently that says all companies uh, will, on, on demand, ship that information uh, back to the government. Uh, and so uh, it's not that we don't like any particular activity or, or company, but when those uh, companies have uh, these covert, coercive, or corrupt ties that aren't being very clearly seen, uh, we, we, you know, our, I would think it's in everyone's interest to identify what those are early before large investments um, and others. It's, it's a hard subject, um, but I think the evidence is clear enough. I mean, just circumstantial evidence, not to mention the, the rest. And we share that uh, whenever we can. Thank you. Uh, Garrett Van der Wees from George Mason University. In your address, uh, you mentioned that in the past, the US turned quite a bit of a blind eye to human rights violations uh, in China. Uh, these days, China is increasingly aggressive towards population with its own borders, uh, East Turkestan, Tibet, and threatening democracies uh, on its doorstep, Taiwan, Hong Kong. Um, in what way are the policies that you would follow uh, on human rights and democracy different from before? You know, the great thing about this job, and as the speech showed, is that there are differences in administrations, but the general idea uh, of human rights, um, you know, all the things we stand for, you know, every man is, all men are created equal, endowed with certain rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Um, Th those are consistent. And so we've been consistent on these things all along. We just haven't been as vocal or, you know, sometimes we sort of self-censored uh, on this, but this administration has decided you can't do that anymore. It's gotten to the point now that it's going the wrong way, and before we get faced with something really, really bad, somebody's got to stand up and be counted. And so at the United Nations General Assembly back in September, October, September, uh, Deputy Secretary hosted a great event um, on the human rights issues in Xinjiang. 31 sponsored, or five sponsored, uh, and 31 countries represented there. Uh, and I think as you've seen in the news recently, the subject is getting the attention it deserves. Absolutely. Okay, woman in white over here. Um, hello, I'm Hyun Young Park with the Korean news media, Chungang Ilbo. Um, thank you for your great presentation. You've mentioned that um, not only the U.S., but most of the rest of the world should stand up with the U.S. in preserving the uh, value that we have um, enjoyed for the last seven decades. Um, however, in some ways, um, Asia, East Asian countries um, located very closely to China, um, they have their day-to-day -day living business. So they claim that it is a bit difficult to actually fully stand by US. And I, you had um, the lunch with the ASEAN um, ambassadors. Um, so is Korea. I think it, the issue is pretty same. What would be your advice? Because those countries say that they are actually um, neighbors with China. Um, it's not quite easy to actually um, stand up for the US. Thank you. So I would love to, um, this is a great opportunity to um, praise Korea's decision in favor of its own uh, sovereignty and its ability to defend itself on the decision on THAAD. Um, despite the pressure, uh, most economic and otherwise, uh, the Korean government did the right thing and, and, and stood up uh, in the face of this thing at great economic cost too. And so again, um, high praise for that. That's an example I think other countries should uh, look at. And what we have seen, uh, is Australia to me is the perfect example of how, I mean, they were the ones on the leading edge of this, of how you eventually decide for your own, you know, who you are, democratic, uh, liberal, trade, all those things. And you decide to f understand that there will be consequences, but you stand up for your national ideals. And then you get others to stand with you. And I think the more you can multilateralize, more voices saying the exact same thing will prevent this sort of behavior. So, 
great. Okay. Let's go to this side, gentleman in the back. All the way in the back. Turn around. Yes. Thank you. Hello. I'm Song Ho Park from South Korean Media, NBC. I've got two questions Another about North Korea. Korea. Uh, with, uh, you only get one. <laughs> Let me be uh, quick. Uh, uh, with respect to possible provocation by North Korea, are you concerned that North Korea uh, will test ICBM soon? And like Ambassador Kelly Krupp said in the United Nations yesterday, are you be f uh, ready to be flexible with North Korea if they do their, do their part? Thank you. So I will lead this by saying that Steve Began, as a special representative, is responsible and entirely focused on this issue. So I can speak to the broad contours, but I, I, I can't get into details. What I will say is that if you look at the, the records since uh, you know, January 2017 and the U.S. engagement with North Korea from a position of strength, uh, that we have seen most of this uh, unfortunate behavior drop considerably. Uh, threats are threats. We've heard threats before. Whether they actually carry those threats out in light of where the president has said he wants to go. He wants, uh, he wants to work with North Korea. He wants to help build their economy. But there's also the, the reminder that we can't have any more of this unfortunate, uh, ill-advised behavior. And that hasn't changed. That position is, is the same. OK. Um, this gentleman over here. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Atsushi Takemoto with Kyoto News. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, the other day, Russian foreign minister was in D.C. and he met with the Secretary Pompeo and the President. And one of the sticking points uh, of the conversation was the uh, extension of uh, new START treaty and the possible uh, nuclear dis uh, disarmament uh, framework. So I'm wondering if uh, you could share with us how the United States is going to uh, reach out to China and to have them engaged in the uh, potential disarmament talk. Thank you so much. The Secretary Pompeo, it, it, he graduated first in his class at West Point, which is no small feat. And he can manage all this information effortlessly. It's all I can do to manage the uh, East Asia Pacific account. So fully aware of the conversation, but I can't say I've spoken or put a lot of thought into it other than I know there is a desire. Uh, if, if we're going to talk about strategic subjects, uh, arms control, it really ought to include everybody that, that has a part in that, and certainly the larger of them. And of course, China is one of those. Okay. All right. This woman in gray over here with the scarf. Yes. Thank you. This looks a lot like press conference. I too am from the media outlet, but I will try to be as prompt as possible. All the hands are from the media. <laughs> South Korean media outlet, Donga Daily and Channel 8 uh, TV, Jong An Kim, Washington correspondent. Yesterday, when uh, the US led the um, Security Council uh, meeting, uh, right after that, uh, North Korea actually issued a statement today saying that they're extremely offended, offended by such gesture and that they are now, they have decided which path to take. But at the same time, though, um, China and Russia yesterday actually um, insinuated that there has to be a little bit of a more flexibility from the U.S. side, more specifically lessening the pressure on sanctioning part. Um, what's the U.S.'s position if and when North Korea provokes with ICBM um, uh, this year? Would there be a ramping up the sanctions to put more pressure on North Korea? And how would U.S. deal with Russia and Chinese um, opposition to such measures? Thank you. Well, I think it's good that this subject is, I mean, pretty much universal. <clears throat> this is probably, a, a nuclear North Korea is not something uh, anybody really wants. And a long list of U.N. Security Council resolutions support that. And so um, your, your question isn't a U.S. question. It's a U.N. question, right? These are, the, these are agreements by the five members to include the PRC and Russia. Uh, on how to deal with this issue, because you, you just can't have it spread any further. Uh, and we do have the opportunity to you know, show North Korea uh, another path that gets to what, again, the president said, is helping them become uh, prosperous, uh, peaceful, and all the rest. So I'll point to the UN on that question. Is there a question from somebody who's not from the media? <laughs> all the hands go down. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> 
Well, thank you for taking my question. <clears throat> my name is Angel, and I'm with Hong Kong Phoenix Television. So my question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, I worked wow. in the United Nations before, though. So <laughs> uh, my question is, uh, as you have mentioned, there are opportunities still that between the U.S. and the and China. But today, when we discuss about, discuss about what are the opportunities, people focus on uh, global issues, climate change, or decrease nuclear weapons. What are the other areas that that are not global issues, but the U.S. and China can still collaborate on bilaterally? Thank you. Well. Um the first one that comes to mind is peaceful use of uh, shared uh, assets like global commons, like oceans, fisheries, airspace. <clears throat> These are things that it would be good to have a conversation about. Um, again, uh, I don't have to go into detail on South China Sea and all the rest. There, uh, you know, fentanyl, although I don't really consider that a, uh, a pure area of cooperation, uh, we personally believe that there could have been more done a long time ago, but the fact that they have arrested somebody on uh, this very um, dangerous and uh, yeah. deadly problem uh, demonstrates their willingness, or at least their understanding of how serious we are on that. Um, I mean, the, the, the number, there actually is nothing we can't cooperate on, but there has to be a will from the other side. The U.S. has been wide open about that. Um, but you know, we're not going to have talks for talk's sake. We need to have a conversation where both sides come prepared to find a, a Mutual understanding. Okay, I'm going to try again. Any questions from somebody who's not from the media? <laughs> I think the entire room is from the media. <laughs> Thanks for your. Thank you. Uh, I'm from media, Sound of Hope Radio Network. My question is from a highly page viewed video interview to Professor Also Warden who is professor of international relations in UPenn. He said in the interview that a very high up man as a sort of an advisor, very close to Xi Jinping, <coughs> told to him that everybody knows that this system doesn't work. That means CCP's system doesn't work. We have reached Si Hu Tong, which means that comes to an end. We don't know what's the next step to take. This is original quote in the video interview. My question is to Secretary Steele. Could you elaborate? Uh, American people have been fulfill the responsibility to help defend the freedom for people in other countries in the history. Could you elaborate how American people have been blessed by preserving the freedom and universal, and universal value from our founding fathers? And if you want, would you like to talk more about Americans' principle in Asia and the Pacific affairs in the future? Thank you. A, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a form of this question came up last week about pluralism, as we were talking about, and there's pluralism in the international sphere, which allows more than one country, one system, one idea to exist at the simultaneously. And then the question was, does that have to include you know, pluralism in every country? Does every country have to be a, a democratic system? And the answer is no. We, sovereignty is a key idea there. We would encourage countries to understand the benefits that, that come with having a system that accounts for the desires and, and the voice uh, of all people. But it's not my job or anyone's job to tell the Chinese people uh, or the Chinese government how to run itself. But, uh, but there are lines and there are things that we cannot abide. There are things we have to stand up for. And those are those, the basic human rights uh, that, that, in this case, uh, we are, being, are discussing. Our goal not, is not to um, you know, undermine or any of those things. It's not a black hand, but this is standing up for something. I mean, it's, I go back to the golden rule. If you're doing this to someone else, ask yourself, would you, would the, you, would you like that happening to you? And if the answer is no, then well, you know, you shouldn't, I don't think you should do that. Um, anyway, I hope that answers your question. In Chinese, there's, of course, a similar saying, a cheng yu, that hmm. basically means right. the same thing, do unto others as they would do unto you. OK, so this will be the very last question. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank
thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, thank you, Assistant Secretary. Um, my name is Dong Hui Yu with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. Um, in your speech, you emphasize the, that the historic record shows that the United States was trying to uh, help China rather than uh, keep China down. So, will you assure that uh, right now, the United States still have a kind of engagement policy toward China, rather than this coupling policy toward China, uh, even though the United States has regarded China as the strategic competitor. Thank you very much. I, I will let the Chinese government speak for itself, but I would ask that same question uh, to the Chinese representatives here in D.C. or elsewhere to describe their, to, 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 to tell you how they feel about the relationship with the U.S. Uh, over time. W what words do they use to describe the nature of the relationship? And it's not strategic competitor. Um, uh, and so the fact that we're acknowledging that there's a competition does not lead to a conclusion that conflict is inevitable. In fact, the, fact the competition is there to prevent conflict by eventually saying you're about to cross a line don't go any further. That's, that's the policy, is to stand up and, and you know, demonstrate strength and then insist that our interests are uh, considered and respected. Well, I really want to thank you um, so much, uh, Assistant Secretary Stilwell, for coming today and uh, delivering a, a very important speech. Uh, we know that the, uh, the Communist Party and the government in China want to make it difficult for the people of China to really hear the truth about the history um, and to hear the truth that what we want is a cooperative uh, relationship with China that serves both of our country's interest, uh, that the policy of this administration is not one of containment of China, as you said. So I hope that since there are, that there's so much media in the room today that you will help to amplify that message um, so that many people around the world and, the, uh, and, and also within uh, the borders of the People's Republic of China will, uh, will, will hear the very important message that Assistant Sec Secretary Stilwell conveyed to us today. And my compliments to Bonnie. Uh, she just got off a plane. Uh, she's been awake for 48 straight hours. So. If, I, if I'm a little incoherent, you'll know why. So. Thank you for the invitation. For Thank staying you. Awake. <laughs>